Dulcie Everett. She is the author of Brexit, The Problems of Englishness in Pre- and Post-Brexit Referendum Literature. This is fascinating. I Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Um, I guess I just have to start off with, how did you recognize that this that there was something happening here in post-Brexit uh, UK? Yeah, so obviously I am English um, and this was the first sort of political moment that I felt really engaged with. I was 18 at the time of the referendum and it was a watershed moment in, in more than one way. But for me, it was it was a really, um, it was a real turning point for my engagement with politics and uh, my recognition of sort of the polarization that has been simmering for quite some time. Um, right after the referendum happened, there were a few texts already coming out in very, very quick uh, succession. Mm -hmm. So the first one that I think of when, uh, in my own experience, seeing it published was Ali Smith's Autumn. Mm -hmm. um, when it was published, I was sort of amazed at how quickly um, it had been turned around. It was a matter of months. And it really, I picked it up straight away and it, I felt it really captured the political moment. So I got, it was in the back of my mind for a while and I became quite interested in this as a literary movement. Um, and by the time I was a senior in college, I went to Connecticut College um, and I studied English. Um, it came time to work out a thesis topic. And I kind of thought back to that experience and was researching whether this was kind of a, a viable um, topic. And it turns out that Brexit, which was a term coined by the Financial Times, hmm. was really in motion. So I really wanted to dedicate some time to understanding what the cultural literary response to Brexit had been. Um, so my book is it's really about it's about that. It's about the cultural emotional reaction. Um, and that's sort of that's sort of how I came across it and how I became interested in it. Um, before we get into what types of themes uh, are occurring in this literature. Can we just remind folks, uh, our audience is primarily in, in the US, right. what was Brexit, uh, who was behind it, and, and really where it stands right now? Absolutely. So Brexit is um, the term that's used for the UK's exit from the European Union. Um, so Essentially, it was a debate between two sides in the UK, the Leave side and the Remain side. Um, in 2015, David Cameron announced that there would be a referendum. Um, so the people would be deciding whether we stayed in the EU or whether we left. Uh, and that was going to take place in 2016 in June. Uh, and the, the debate trail kind of followed that. And the Remain side was spearheaded by Cameron uh, and his uh, government and then although you had a lot of Eurosceptics in his in his government as well in his party um, but the Leave side was spearheaded by our now Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage who is the leader of was the leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party otherwise known as UKIP. Uh, and, and Boris Johnson is from the Tory party so these are yes. conservatives uh, yes. just to put it in perspective. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we talked a little bit about Bannon just at the top, but Steve Bannon was very close with Farage and, and meeting with him on on Brexit strategy. Um, do folks realize this now? I mean, of course, it wasn't just conservatives who voted for Brexit. Is there sort of an understanding of, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't have done this or, or are people still firmly supporting Brexit at the same numbers? So obviously it was very close uh, referendum. So the Leave vote won by 51% uh, and the Remain vote uh, lost. It was 49%, so it was extremely close. Yeah. Um, and apparently, well, I read the other day in a, in a poll, nine and nine and 10 people would vote the same way again. Wow. Right, so there's still very staunch beliefs about Brexit. Um, I, think, I think the pandemic has kind of cast over a lot of this happening because we've been focused elsewhere but um i do think there is still uh strong like strong feelings about it um coming from my own perspective you know i think these things are always biased who, who you're surrounded by and who you speak to and things like that so mm -hmm. i think there's from my perspective a bit more 
of um, kind of settling into the reality of the situation, which is that we have left the EU and this is what's happening. Uh, there's really, there's no argument for going back. I don't think it'd be appropriate to suggest that we should go back and sort of do a do-over or something like that. But um, I think people are kind of coming to terms with it still. And um, as you sort of mentioned before, the, the implications of Brexit are still being played out. Uh, we're not really sure where we're going to be in 10 years um, post-referendum, but policies are still kind of slowly developing. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you have post-Brexit literature, that is part of the propaganda to keep people engaged and and and, and committed to Brexit. So, so post-Brexit literature is really actually more from a Remain perspective. Okay. Um, so, pre and post-Brexit referendum literature both problematize Englishness as an identity uh, for several reasons, but um, predominantly because a it's a proto-nationalism. It doesn't mm -hmm. reflect the actual nation that we're a part of. So we are the UK with the United Kingdom, Britain, and that is made up of four nations, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England. So saying Englishness or Scottish nationalism, Irish nationalism, Welsh nationalism, it doesn't reflect the nation state. Right. So in that way, they're sub nationalisms and they're kind of tricky in that regard. The English nationalism is also unique because it's just so difficult to define even as a sub-nationalism, part of the problem with it is that if you asked people on the street, I think they'd have a really hard time telling you. Hmm. Um, I always thought about it as something that was kind of a series of stereotypes, you know, stiff up a lip or um, keep calm, carry on, things like that. And I do think there's an element of those things kind of unite um, English people. But it's a very tricky, uh, it's a very tricky identity. That they both so pre and post Brexit authors are kind of grappling with what is Englishness, what does it look like, what does it mean um, politically, emotionally, and post Brexit referendum literature is sort of seeking to understand the um, implications. So some of the texts that I look at leave room for hope. So they kind of acknowledge that there are problems and they acknowledge that. A lot of what followed the referendum was uh, um, vitriolic. It was very divisive, yeah. um, but they kind of allow for a little bit of rejuvenation. So the example I gave earlier of Ali Smith's Autumn, she uses time as a really unique force to kind of show how things just recycle. So mm -hmm. Autumn is part of a seasonal quartet. There's four books. Um, they follow the seasons and it's kind of a theme within the novel that things decay, they grow and then they decay. So things are, are built and they fall down or we join the EU, we leave the EU. She kind of sees it almost indifferently as just part of the, the natural cycle. Hmm. Um, whereas some other post-Brexit texts are very dystopian, they're very harsh and unforgiving. So a dystopian novel that I looked at was Perfidious Albion by Sam Byers. Um, and it is set in a small town and people are used as sort of uh, ex experiment an, uh, an experiment is played on the citizens of this town uh, from a data company uh, it's very sort of Cambridge Analytica yeah. um, relating to all of that kind of thing and that ends literally by saying error 404 you know page cannot be found um, so it's almost saying there is no future you know left the EU that's it it's kind of all over. And The Cockroach by Im Kewen similarly is very harsh. Um, that is, it's a novella and it's a take on Kafka's metamorphosis. Uh, and it envisages the government cabinet as having been infiltrated by cockroaches who have literally <laughs> morphed into the government. Um, so it's very unforgiving. <laughs> that um, seems more, more realistic to me <laughs> than any of them. It did to many people, it did to many people. You know, I mean, one of the criticisms, obviously, of that book is that there's no, there's no nuance whatsoever. It's um, it's very, um, very in in your in his perspective, um. But yeah, no, I mean, like I said, it was such a divisive topic that it did uh, initiate some really strong feelings. Um, and it is interesting that post Brexit referendum literature is written from a, a Remain perspective. Hmm. Uh, it's something that I'm still trying to kind of work out I think part of it is that 
it was more of a shock, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and it felt like there was something that needed to be dealt with uh, that on the leave side perhaps wasn't, it was sort of obvious or, although I think it was, it was a bit of a shock to everyone uh, from, from, from my perspective. On the, on the left, I mean, you mentioned that, um, you know, there, there are these many identities, Britishness, Englishness is, is, it's complicated, but um, I was in Scotland uh, a few months ago and, you know, I met with some people that were in the Scottish independence movement and, you know, I, I thought to myself, I'm really curious why, I'm sure there has been organizing, but why the organizing of breaking up the UK was not the alternative, an alternative, or at least got to the level of national like, international awareness, um, as opposed to Brexit. Is that as popular? Are people engaged with it as much? Is there a, sort of an alternative movement to do so? Yeah, I mean, Scottish nationalism is something that has been quite focused on independence. You look at mm -hmm. Nicola Sturgeon still pretty focused on, on another independence referendum. There have been a uh, referenda on that. Um, and the most recent um, voted to remain in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be, I haven't noticed it as a, a really viable alternative to Brexit itself, although post Brexit, it revived that notion for Nicola Sturgeon, you know, if we leave, we can rejoin the EU. Um, but I think by virtue of being on an island ourselves, it would be perhaps quite difficult. Um, people enjoy being able to just go to Scotland, come to England, um, mm -hmm. and feeling part of the, of the island, I think. Um, so I wouldn't say necessarily that it was an alternative to, to Brexit, but I do think that Brexit has perhaps given uh, nationalist movements a bit of a, a nudge towards bringing that back to the fore. And it's important to note as well that there is devolved government within the UK. So um, there is a Scottish Parliament and a Welsh and the Northern Irish Parliament. So you do have some separation from Westminster, but it is still very Anglo-centric. Mm -hmm. How much of this this, this post Brexit literature um, from the Remain side is ties in with really what's happening with you in general? I mean, we're, we're we're talking today as Russia is flexing its muscles against Ukraine, and of course, um, many members of the EU are very concerned about this. Not all of them. Um, there are absolutely like links between uh, Putin folks, I'll say, and and pushing uh, for Brexit because, of course, it, it would, you know, in, probably in his perspective, it weakened the EU, which is a big opposition to him. So is, is is that, where do people feel right now? I mean, in in general, like, is there any sort of public opinion on on how Russia is flexing its muscles against the EU and, and how the UK is not being part of this conversation um, plays into, you know, some escalation? Sure. Um, I can't say I'm an expert on this area, just to, to be mm -hmm. clear, but I, I think that um, Brexit, it was it was leaving the EU from a bureaucratic perspective. And I think from even on the Leave side, there was a kind of acknowledgement that you're still going to have to engage with Europe in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at a moment like this, it is a mutual interest uh, to, to stop what's happening. Um, but I'm not, I'm not aware of the kind of big uh, link um, that's being spoken about necessarily. How far into Brexit are, are you right now? Is it completely disentangled or? No, I mean, there's still negotiations ongoing. Uh, it's kind of difficult <laughs> to keep up with it all, frankly. I mean, it's been yeah. six years since the referendum um, and it, we left officially, we left the EU in uh, December 2020. So it's only it's even been two years yet. So um, I think there's still, it, it is still all ongoing. Um, there are still things to work out. And that is, like I said, something that's kind of being, or has been potentially kicked down the road a little bit due to the pandemic. Do you think that this post-Brexit post literature is working? I mean, if there's a if there's an agenda, do you think it's working? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure that it's an agenda necessarily. So I think, my perspective on post-Brexit referendum literature is that it's almost serving as a time capsule now. Mm -hmm. It was published so quickly. So all of the texts, I define uh, Brexit in my book as the texts that were published from the referendum. So June uh, 2016 until we left in December 2020. So in that 
in that short period, uh, books were published, you know, with such speed. Um, and I think the agenda is to capture the moment, the emotional mm. immediate moment. Um, I'm not convinced that it will um, serve as a, a way for kind of changing minds necessarily, though I hope that it will promote dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I really um, would like people to know about the book is that it doesn't come from, obviously I have political biases, we all do, and then we write uh, those come through. And like I say, all of the texts are really from a Romain perspective, so it's difficult not to do that. But I'm not coming from a position of this is the right way to think, or this is the only way, or I don't think it's intended to lecture. I think it's supposed to be about facilitating um, discussions and understanding what the political mood was, how people were speaking about mm -hmm. Brexit. So a lot of, the, as you said about um, themes earlier, I suppose I'll say some of them now. So obviously with the Leave campaign, um, a little bit like what we saw with Donald Trump's campaign, uh, you were tapping into nostalgia, you were mm -hmm. tapping into sort of xenophobia and isolationism. Um, that's not to say that everyone who voted for Leave or for Trump is necessarily, you know, 100% um, invested in those, in that rhetoric. But that's absolutely what was sort of put forth. Um, sorry, yeah, so I think that um, it's it's really a way of capturing the reaction, the immediate feeling and uh, serving as, because they are time capsule for future. I think in 50 years, you're gonna be able to look at this and really get a sense of what it was um, to be in the country when the referendum happened. I mean, personally, I remember I remember the day very vividly. Um, I'm sure that you would remember the day that Trump selected very vividly, and most people will. These are very key moments. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the feeling in London um, was, was low. You could feel it. Um, and I actually moved to the US in 2016, right before Trump was elected. And it was the same feeling uh, on my university campus. Um, and like I say, people have different reactions to these things, but from my experience uh, and from reading these books, my interpretation is that they're just really tapping into what people feel, <laughs> um, what, what from this political perspective, how it felt. Well said. I mean, that's ultimately what, what, what every movement is about is they're trying to tap into what people are feeling if they're obviously effective. Um, really interesting take. I'm, I'm fascinated by this. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a unique kind of observation that, that you've been able to pick up and um, hopefully one that folks are going to become more conscious of uh, as, as we see this type of literature. I'm sure it's, it's happening. We had it here too with, with the, uh, uh, the resistance crowd. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we sure. call them. Um, yeah, it's definitely ongoing um, as well. I should say that this isn't a comprehensive book by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Brexit texts are still going to be published. Um, and I think you could classify any book now that uh, comes out that really focuses on the implications of the referendum as Brexit. So uh, that's important to know as well. You can be a Brexit an analyst now. <laughs> Yeah, future <laughs> career. There we go. Dulce Everett, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you can check out Dulce's book, uh, Brexit, The Problems of Englishness in Pre- and Post-Brexit and Referendum Literature, uh, published by our friends at Zero Books. Just such a pleasure, and, and, and please keep us updated on everything. Thank you so much for having me. Our patrons have been a very big part of our ability to grow, to develop partnerships. Uh, it really, it's 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 been... They've been the lifeblood during this pandemic. We launched the show right before the pandemic. And thanks to our patrons, we have been able to keep going and have a team and get great guests and graphics, all these things. Like, I can't do any of that. I can't, like, see. This is David. David does this. But this is because we have patrons. So if you're not already a patron and you're able to be one, join us at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. They're all different levels. We also have some swag in there. We had to do this organically. We are independent, truly independent. No one gave us a list. It was really just through this progressive, independent word of mouth. So if you can, you know, show us some love and keep in mind, you know, it's, it's, there are not a lot of women in the indie media. So you are supporting a women run show.